sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And although I understand that this was a children's rhyme written to help defend against name calling, verbal bullying, it was intended to increase resiliency, avoid physical retaliation, and remain calm and peaceful while people are saying things that are wrong against you. It is the stupidest sentence in the entire world, and it is not true. Because in fact, words do hurt. Words do hurt. I can replay moments in my life as a child that I use this rhyme as my faith confession as neighborhood children were making fun of me. I was proclaiming it with confidence as tears streamed down my face. Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And the truth was their words did hurt and I just wanted them to stop. There was a summer in which we didn't have a whole lot of money growing up and my mom took me to the rag shop. Anybody remember the rag shop? My mom took me to the rag shop and I got to pick out a certain number of yards of fabric and she made me my summer play clothes because it was cheaper to do that than to go buy clothes at the store. I mean, this was before there was Walmart and Kmart in town, right? We just, we didn't have it and, and I can remember being made fun of because my clothes were obviously made and not purchased and it bothered me, it hurt me. I wanted it to stop. I would stand there boldly and proclaim that their words weren't hurting me but the truth was they were actually ripping me apart. I can vividly remember moments in my life where people that I honored and respected said words to me that cut me emotionally and still have scars there today. We're beginning a brand new series called Hashtag Struggling, and today's topic is comments. Comments. We love the fact that we can make comments on anything today. In society today, everybody has a voice, and they can make it heard and known on just about every platform possible. You can comment on someone's social media post. You can comment on a YouTube video. You can comment on an online product. You can make your voice heard on an Amazon product that you bought. You can comment on someone's podcast. And if a business has not stepped into the 21st century, they might still have a box that you can drop a paper comment in and let your voice heard. We love the fact that we can make comments. I can say whatever I want. We comment our likes, we comment our dislikes, we comment our emotions, we comment if a product works or doesn't work. You know, I read some people's product reviews and they annoy me. <laughs> they do. Like, if you got something in the mail that was broke in shipping, it wasn't a faulty product, it's the shipping company dropped your product. But they'll give it a bad review, product came destroyed. So UPS should have got that review, not the Amazon product. Like, people just don't get it, how it works. Anyway, whatever. We comment our experiences because if we had a bad experience, we want to help someone else not have that bad experience. Or if we had a really great experience, we want someone else to enjoy the kind of experience that we had ourselves. But here's my big idea today. But what do you do when you are the product that is being commented on and the feedback you are receiving isn't at all what you expected? What do you do when you are the product being commented on? We'll call that hashtag gossiping about you. Gossiping about you. Bunch of people getting behind your back, talking bad about you, making comments about you, comments about your character, comments about what kind of person you are, what kind of mom you are, what kind of dad you are, what kind of business you are, what kind of friend you are. Huh? What about when you're the product people are talking about 
and those comments are negative, the comments hurt. What do you do when you've been told something by your parents that hurt you? It was something negative. It wasn't positive to push you forward. And that comment has become a thread weaved throughout your life. Let's talk about a comment thread for a moment. A comment thread is a video happens, a product happens, they ask you for your comment, you make a comment, and now all of a sudden, this thing just goes. There's hundreds of other people making comments they can reply to your comment, you can reply to their comment, and before long, this comment thread that's running five pages long is no longer even talking about the product. It's turned into fighting with each other. Well, if you think that, you're an idiot. Come on. I don't know how a product review, if you read somebody's product, they end up turning political. I'm like, what did politics have to do with a toaster oven? <laughs> Dear Lord. And this is a comment thread. It started out as one single comment about a product or an action or a video. And before long with other comments, other input, it could turn into something completely different. It's happened in your life. There's been a comment in your life, inevitably, that was spoken over you, that created an emotion, it created some kind of response, it created some kind of reply, and has been a thread that has weaved through your life. A comment like, you're no good, bad boy, bad girl, I'm ashamed of you, you can't do that, what's wrong with you? We can't afford that, we're broke. You're ugly, you're fat, you're lazy. A comment, singular comment, posted to the wall of your life, starts a thread. It starts a thread. And every time that comment is revisited, every time that comment is replied to, it creates a new trigger in your life. It creates that same emotional response that comes up from when you were a kid. Today, I want to look at the Word of God. I want to look at a Bible story where a guy had a comment thread running through his life, and it affected him. First, we want to look at his victory, how he got delivered, but then we want to look back and see why it took him so long to get there. Is that all right today? In Acts 14, Acts is in the New Testament, in my opinion, Acts is the first book of the Bible in the New Testament. Okay, now I know that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is after the middle of your Bible and, it goes, and it's in the New Testament, but technically the new covenant in Jesus Christ hasn't happened until the end of John. Acts is the beginning of the church age. Everything that happens in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is under the law. Everything Jesus ever did and said is under the law. Acts begins the church age. It's the new covenant, okay? Acts 14, verse 10. We're talking about Paul here. He's in Lystra, and it says this. There sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth, and he had never walked. So lame means he, just, he was paralyzed. He couldn't walk. In this day and age, and I, I, I want to be politically correct, but back then, what I'm about to say was politically correct, Okay? In this day and age, he was born as a defective product, right? He couldn't walk. The product that his parents had as a child was birth defective. If you got a microwave that you bought on Amazon, you brought it home, you plugged it in, and it began to smoke, the first second you plugged it in, you're gonna call the company and tell them, I got a defective product. This young man, this gentleman, has been dubbed defective product. He was born, his legs not working. He listened to Paul as he was preaching. Paul looked directly at him and saw that he had faith to be healed and called out to him, stand up on your feet. 
At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. Man, what a great story. But there's so much left out of this story. It, it, it's a very simple story, but I have to ask myself some questions like, what was Paul preaching? What was the circumstances surrounding all of these things? How come this man never sought healing before? In this day and age, if you were born blind, lame, deaf, or any other sort of noticeable ailment, any sort of disease, if you were born autistic, you were probably dubbed demon-possessed. They, they, didn't, they didn't know how to equate issues in that generation. So if you were born with any sort of disease or any sort of mal malfunction in the birthing cycle, it was believed that you were that way because of either your father's sin or your grandfather's sin. It's where we got the teaching and the idea, ideology of generational curses. I want you to really listen to me today as I get into this, okay? If you've ever said, well, this just runs in the family. Well, my father was this way, so it just makes sense that I'm this way. In the church world, there's this belief system called generational curses. These are comments that people would make, right? He was born this way, it's because your father sinned or your grandfather sinned, comments. Multiple times throughout the scripture, as Jesus would go heal somebody, lame, deaf, or blind, a disciple would ask, why is this man this way? Is it a sin that he committed or a sin that his father committed? And a lot of times Jesus would say, it's not anybody's sin, but that God might be glorified. Where did this belief come from? Where did this ideology of generational curses come from? Well, let's look at it. Exodus 34, verse seven. Exodus 34, so Genesis is the first book of the Bible, Exodus. So this is a long, long time ago. Maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet God, he won't leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Dear Lord. So I wonder, I wonder if there's compounding punishment. Because I know that maybe my great, 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 great granddaddy probably did something bad. And then is that compounded interest on punishment? Now listen, Exodus 34, 7, this was true. This was true in Exodus 34, verse 7. This was part of the Mosaic law. This was part of the law that was passed down from God to man with the Ten Commandments and all those things. If you didn't fulfill those laws, if you broke any of those commandments or laws, you were guilty of this sin to the third and fourth generation. It was true then. This is where the belief of the generational curses come from. Well, this just runs in the family. Comments. You know why you're that way? Your great granddaddy was like that. Comments. You know why you're bald? Great granddad was bald. I'm just, I don't know. That's, gen that's genetics. That's different. Here's what I want to tell you today. I need you to listen to me very, very carefully. Very, very, very carefully. Exodus 34, verse seven was true in Exodus 34, verse seven. But it is not true after the cross of Jesus Christ. It is not true after the cross of Jesus Christ. Listen, the Bible says this, at salvation, old things are passed away. Behold, all things become New, I'm not stuck into what my great granddaddy did. I'm saved, I'm set free, I'm delivered. New, new. And let's just say that you are doing some of the behaviors of your grand, great grandfather. It's because you saw it happen and you're imitating it. So do what I say sin stands for, S-I-N, stop it now. Stop it now. It ends with you. 
Just stop. Yeah, but you know, we got that type two diabetes that runs in the family. No, you don't. You have a cookbook that runs in the family. Three sticks of butter and your chocolate chip cookies. That's what runs in the family. Knock it off. Eat a salad and go for a walk. Woo, diabetes disappeared, healed. Don't even need divine healing for that one. Come on, somebody. Stop eating pasta every day. Diabetes go away. Come on. This idea of generational curses, listen, it did not pass as true through the cross. It's not there. And the more you confess it, and the more you allow that comment thread to be there, the more you empower it to not take charge of your own life and make changes that you need. Check this out. Let's look back at this. In life should there set a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth. He had never walked. He couldn't walk, but he could listen. My legs don't work, but my ears do. Let me ask you a question today. How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing. I can't walk. I can't get up and walk to you, but I can listen. I can, I, I can hear what you're saying and I can articulate my life differently. He sat there listening to what Paul was speaking. Paul looked directly at him and Paul saw, Paul seeing that the man had, what did that look like? What did it look like that Paul could notice this guy had faith? What changed? What changed? Because his posture didn't. He didn't get up and now dance around. He's sitting there. He's sitting there. But Paul says, there's something different. Something just happened with this guy. Maybe the guy's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like maybe, maybe, maybe like this, his eyes lit up. Something, I want what you're talking about. But this makes me ask some questions because the Bible doesn't tell us here. What was Paul preaching that made this guy have faith? So in our own logical minds, Paul must have been preaching about healing. He must have been preaching if you accept Jesus, he can heal you of all your sicknesses and diseases, right? I mean, that would make sense. But that's not what Paul was preaching. Paul wasn't preaching healing because Paul didn't preach healing. Healing wasn't Paul's mandate. If we look back at the beginning of Paul's ministry, when Paul was Saul, an angel of the Lord appears to him on the Damascus road, says, Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecute me? He brought him into Ananias' house, uh, and he had to begin to learn the word and have a revelation of Jesus. His mandate, Paul's mandate, was to preach salvation to the Gentile. His message was to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. But let's look exactly what Paul preached. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you a hidden gem here, okay? When a pastor is a traveling minister, not like me, but like they go out and they preach at other churches all the time, they have like two or three sermons, that's it. And they preach those two and three sermons over and over and over again. I was taught in Bible school that a sermon is not yours until you've preached it 30 times. That'll never happen in my life. I will never preach a sermon. Could you imagine coming back here 30 times and, I hear, and you hear the same sermon, right? They have one or two sermons. So Paul was preaching the same sermon where he went. So let's find out what Paul was preaching. The chapter before in Acts 13. Let's look at a little snippet, you ready? And I'm gonna get loud, so you might wanna put a little compression on my mic. <laughs> Acts 13, 38. Paul is saying, therefore my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. You can be forgiven of your sin. Are you ready? Now that's cool. That's cool. But this guy didn't live in the comment that he was guilty of his sin. He lived in a world that he was guilty of his daddy's sin. Are you ready? Therefore, my friends, Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sins proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes 
is set free from every sin. A every sin. There, there's no degree of sin. You're set free from every sin. And all of a sudden, wait a second, holy cow. I can be set free from not just my sin, but my daddy's sin and my grandfather's sin. Now watch. Watch what it says here. A justification you were not able to obtain under Exodus 34, verse 7. Under Exodus 34, verse 7, you're never going to walk because you're guilty of sin. But the truth is, once Jesus Christ came to this earth and he gave his life as a ransom and his blood was shed for you, you have forgiveness of every sin, the eternal past and the eternal future, you're forgiven of sin. Hey, hey, hey. You might think I'm crazy, but I'm happy. This man sent back, he's like, wait a second. I ain't never heard a comment like that before in my life. I ain't, yeah. You know what I don't get? I'm gonna speak to someone who can make a bad comment about this sermon. I'm gonna block you anyway. <laughs> Why, as a Christian, do you want to believe that God is mad at you? How self-hating that we want to believe that a God is mad at us when we mess up. Listen, when you mess up, listen, you ever been in a car accident? You ever hit another car? You're like, you're so sorry. Oh my God, I messed up. I, don't sue me. You want this mercy. It's okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of it. Just don't sue me. Like, don't go crazy on me. Like, we want mercy from each other, but then we want to tell people that God doesn't have mercy on us. Or, or, or because you've reached some level of spirituality, you're somehow better than the person who's struggling with sin. I, I, don't, I don't get it today. I, I don't get it today how we don't want to believe that God loves us just the way we are. And that there's this voice that says, you're better than where you're at right now. There's another level. There's a higher level. There's a higher calling. There's another purpose. There's another destiny. You can do this better. You don't have to speak this way. You don't have to use those words. You don't have to operate in anger. He's gonna, he's gonna lift you up, but it's not from an angry tone. This guy sitting back said, wait a second. I can be forgiven every sin I believe. And in that moment, when he could believe that his sin or his grandfather's sin was forgiven, he was healed. This is one of those instances where we can look back at Jesus. And Jesus got attacked because sometimes he would say to somebody, arise and walk, be healed. And other times he would say, your sin is forgiven you, and they be healed. And people would come back and say, who do you think you are that you could tell somebody that they're forgiven of their sin? And Jesus says, wait, wait. Does it take more words and effort to say, be healed, arise, and walk, or just say your sins are forgiven you? Because it's two parts of the same cross, guys. We took communion today, that by his stripes, we're healed. By his blood, we are saved. It all happened on the cross. Healing and salvation are two parts of the same cross. This man believed that he could be forgiven, he received healing. Yes, yes. Happened, one instant, one moment. In one moment, the comment thread that was weaved through his life was destroyed. Everything I believed about myself was a lie. I believed I was this way and I had no choice in the matter. I believe, mm. So in elementary school, I went to Pecana Sink in Circleville. I don't remember what grade it was, fourth, fifth grade, sixth grade. It was before middle school. When it got to that time of the day in our lessons that it was reading time or English, whatever, what, I think it was reading. 
your boy had to leave the classroom and go to a special class with three other kids. And the teacher took their time and really slowly taught us how to read. Your boy was in special needs reading. And I can remember, everybody knew what that special needs teacher, who that special needs teacher was. And when she walked down the hallway to take people out of the class, everybody knew you were not mainstreamed, you were going to special needs. Back then, they used words that were not politically correct today. I'm not gonna say them because I don't want them used out of term on social media later on. But that's how I felt. I felt dumb. I believed I couldn't read. I believed that even if I could read the words, I was gonna stutter. I believed, are you laughing at me? I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be gentle here and like be transparent over here laughing at me. And she thinks having a mask on helps. I, no. <laughs> I know who you are. Seriously, I believed I was dumb. I believed I couldn't read. I believed that even if I could read it, I couldn't maintain, like retain it. I believed it. So as life went on, I believed that my sister Kathy was the smart one and I was the dumb one. She had the book smarts, but you go do stuff with your hands. I believed it. I believed it so strongly that I wouldn't even try to read. I wouldn't try to apply myself. But then I begin to ask some questions. How is it that I can look at things in the world and around me and, and just understand how they work and fix them? How is it that I can walk into a situation where people have been working on something for an hour and I say, oh, there's the problem, and just know? Well, because I was dumb, it had to be God. Right, it had to be the Holy Spirit. You're not smart, but you got the Holy Spirit. So that's how you know all these things. So I went and I took an IQ test. I went and I took an IQ test. I was, where am I at? Am I dumb? Am I really dumb? Let's see where I'm at. I'm not gonna tell you what the number was. <laughs> I'm not gonna tell you what the number was today. But your boy's all right. <laughs> your boy's all right. And I had to realize that my mind worked differently. Once I changed my belief, I consume books today. I consume books today. I, I, I read them and I can understand them and I can apply them on the spot. I can tell some, I can take a very complex thing that I read and tell it to somebody in plain English because I changed what I believed about myself. I had to break the comment thread. And you need to break the comment thread in your life too. We need to have a mind shift about the things that people said to us. Not everything everybody has ever said to you is true. A lot of things have been said to you in your life out of anger that that person said just to hurt you so they felt better about themselves, but it wasn't true. This man, in one instant, was able to reach his hand out and hit delete on the comment thread that was weaved through his life. He says, I can be forgiven, I believe. Some of us in here today need to hit the delete button. You need to hit the delete button. You've allowed some people and some comments access to your life that don't need to be there. You need to hit delete. Some of us in here today need to block some people from commenting on our lives. I'm gonna go in your business for two and a half seconds. Even if it's family. Wow. I'm gonna give you a tool today and I'm gonna give you some permission today to not be a verbal punching bag for your out of control family. Ready? It's not, it's not cool, it's not okay. 
that your family speaks to in a disrespectful manner and you sit there and think you have to take it. No, you do not. You do not. That's abuse. You're at your dinner table, it's whatever day it is, it's Thanksgiving. All of a sudden, here it goes, going right, you know it, every Thanksgiving it's gonna go back to how bad you are and how you didn't do anything and how your sibling's better than you, but whatever. Hey, just real quick, if we're gonna go down this track, I'm gonna pack up my family and we're gonna go. I'm not gonna sit here through this. So, you can keep this conversation going, but you're gonna keep it by yourself. As for me and my house, we're gonna be healthy, we're gonna be happy, we're gonna be whole, we out. You ain't gonna do that. Pack up your family and walk out. You destroyed, no, no, I did not destroy Thanksgiving, you did. I told you the consequences if we were gonna keep going down this path. I'm not doing this. It is okay to remove yourself from a toxic comment situation. I'm gonna throw something out there to you. It's a lie. If you've ever been told, if you've ever been told, you would be nothing without me. It's a lie. It's a lie. I would be happy without you, actually. You would be nothing in this life if it wasn't for me. And that's not true. I would have met somebody just as good, even not better, probably better looking, better attitude, kiss better. Don't get me started. Don't get me started on how you think you are. You do not, you do not have to take that. Yeah, but the Bible, the Bible says what? What do you think turn the other cheek meant? I'm out of here. I'm gonna pack up my family, we're gonna go. But I'm not gonna sit here and live with the anxiety and the pressure of your anger. You need some anger management. I'm trying to, tell, I'm trying to help somebody in here today, you're an angry person, and you take your anger out on your family, you need to stop it. You need to stop it. That's not right, you didn't get enough pop pals as a kid. <laughs> you were allowed to just throw a fit on the floor and kick your feet, and because you got your way then, you think you can do that same thing as an adult. Knock it off. Your anger is not someone else's problem. Comments. We need a mind shift. We need a mind shift. We need to change, listen, we need to change the way we think about ourselves. And the only way to change the way you think about yourself is to understand the way God thinks about you. So I wanna start a new comment thread today, is that all right? Brand new comment through the next two minutes. Jeremiah 29, 11, the most misquoted verse in the entire Bible. It actually says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a hope in the future. If you ever wonder what God thinks about you, yo, God thinks you're awesome. <laughs> yo, God thinks you're awesome. He thinks like you're the greatest thing he ever made. I hope you believe that about yourself. I hope you believe that about yourself. Yo, God thinks I'm stinking awesome. You don't think so? Well, look at what Romans 8.31 says. What shall we say then? If God is for us, who can be against us? We know God is for us because Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the thoughts I think towards you, thoughts of peace and hope and not of evil, thoughts to prosper you and make you successful. You don't think you're awesome? Psalm 139, 14. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Yo, check this out. David said, marvelous is your works. Dag. He's like, dag. Yo, God, you did good. You, woo. You did good. You gotta get that. Get that for a second. Someone who got a poor self-image, some poor self-esteem. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. God, you did good. Woo, feel good about myself. And what's what it says? And my soul knows full well. That's a mind shift. Your soul is your mind. My soul knows that God made me excellent. Deuteronomy 15.10, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 2.16. 
For who has the mind of the Lord that may, he may instruct him? But you have the mind of Christ. If you've ever said to yourself, well, I'm just not creative. You had the mind of Christ, which means you were created by the creator, which means you had the mind of the creator. The creator, which means you have a creative mind. You just haven't learned how to tap into the creativity. That's the truth. Deuteronomy 15, 10, all at the end it says this, blessed will be all of your works in all which you put your hands to. Everything you set your hands to will prosper and be successful. But you gotta change the comment thread. Maybe the comments that you need to block are the words coming out your own mouth. Maybe you need to start speaking things that are building yourself up, that are encouraging yourself, that are pushing you towards success and not tearing you down. Comments. Father, we thank you today that, Lord, only your comment matters towards us. You said that you would give us a hope and a future. You said that you love us just the way we are. You call us unto you. I thank you, Lord, today that we receive this word with gladness. I bless everyone the sound of my voice today. They're the head and not the tail above and never beneath. Everything they set their hands to will prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Real quick, my dad is gonna be with us May 16th. So he'll be coming in from Tennessee. He'll be a guest speaker that day. If, if you know who my dad was, he founded the church. So he will be here May 16th, preaching on the weekend. And I will not be. So I love you all. Offering baskets on the doors on the way out.